up and get that stuff done, and then it's available to the world. And uh, that's part of what's changing uh, the ministry, <laughs> frankly, is the ability to have ministry. One of the most dangerous parts of, of the, the Internet, uh, ministry-wise, is that it takes you away from the connection to the local assembly. And the connection to the local assembly, there are five, I call them operating assets that God has given to you to cause your Christian life to function to its fullest. One is the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. You have been given the resident member of the Godhead. He regenerated you. He implanted His life in you. Then He sealed you with His presence. He is your seal. Number two, you have His written Word. He take, God took, He inspired His Word. That word inspire, in spirit Asian. That's why you hear people describe it as being God-breathed, the breath, the Spirit of God. He put it in some words, wrote those words on a, on a page. That's what inscripting is. And those words have His Spirit. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And the, the, the way you have contact with the Spirit of God is through the words on the page of His, of his book. The only thing physical that you can ever possess that gives you a contact with God is not some way first, not some religious activity. It's, it's words in a, in a book. The words on the page there aren't the physical pages of the issue. You can tear them up, write on them, all that kind of stuff. You don't destroy them. But those words have got, you have that asset where you have thus saith the Lord and you have His Spirit's ability to work. Then you have teachers, pastors and teachers to communicate the doctrine of God's Word. Then you have the local church which is sort of like the classroom for the the, 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 the communication of the doctrine. But it's not, when I think of it, I think of it more as a, like a life science laboratory. Did you ever go to a science class and then you had a lab? You, you went to class and you studied about the frog and then you went to the lab and you cut him open and peeled him back and got your hands dirty with it. You took a language class and I did this, so I take French, and you. They don't. They don't talk right. <laughs> so then you go to lab, and you listen, and you use the Pilsner message, your method about you know you hear it, you repeat it, you hear it, and it, you kind of get your hands, in, in, you know. Well, the local church is that kind of a classroom. It's not where you just learn, didactically and theoretically. But it's where you learn it in, in the practical rub up against someone else and make it work kind of thing. You follow that? The local church is where you put it in shoe leather. And then the fifth asset is prayer. Praying like a grace believer. Not praying like the heathen, not praying like Israel. But prayer is when you take God's Word and you take the circumstances of your life where you live and you take God's Word and you apply it there and you use that, cre you talk, you, you're talking to God about the application of His Word and, you, and there's that living connection. And those things, especially that issue of the pastor teacher, pastors and teachers and the local church, one of the things you'll have to discover and have to develop guys, in the use of the internet and the use of media in the future is how not to use it in a partial, incorrect kind of way, not to use it just to make gain is godliness. One of the things on the internet I say, whoo, we had a thousand hits on our site. <laughs> well, that's interesting. And I think every hit's important because, you know, souls are important and they represent people. 
But when you gauge success based on that, or is success based on what I'm teaching on this is sound doctrine, whether anybody listens or not. But one of the things, I said last night about anonymity, one of the problems with anonymity is that it takes you a step away from accountability to the brethren. And that issue is, is something that is, is a critical key factor in the way things develop. I, I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about, here we are. The next step, the future, is going to be a developing in a lot of ways into some new areas. Now, I, I say to you like this, the next generation of grace believers, and I, I say that now because I look at Ted, and he's not that young kid I used to know. <laughs> John behind him is not that young guy that I used to know. I, I, was, I was watching Pastor Curtis a couple weeks ago teaching Romans in Sunday school, and I, I was sitting back there listening, and I thought, you know... I, He's not a kid anymore. He's a granddaddy. Alex is a granddaddy. Can you imagine that? I said, that can't be. I got pictures of him in my office. He's just, just a little squirt. <laughs> and every time I think of that, I say, yeah, look at what it makes me. I tell our folks here in our church, for years and years and years and years and years, I was the youngest person on our board. When I first came on the church board back in 79, everybody on the board was anywhere from 25 to 40 years older than I was. They've all gone to heaven now. Every one of them moved to heaven. They left, moved off and left us. <laughs> and uh, now I'm the oldest guy on the board. That's scary to me. Because I think about what those men were to me and how inadequate I feel to be to the younger guys now what they were to me. And I think about that, and I think, you know, the generation's coming, and the next generation. And I, I've begun to think a lot about how to help the younger people here. And I, I was teaching just a minute ago, and it dawned on me how many of you haven't heard some of the things I mentioned earlier. <laughs> that thing about the doctrine of the city, that thing about the, the seasonal things and those things about, uh, about, the, about the starting the assemblies and that kind of thing. That's, that's critical to the things that we've done. And uh, those, the studies and the tapes and all that stuff's available. I hope you'll make yourself available to that kind of stuff. But in the future, you're going to not just develop new or further ideas and thinking. You're going to have to develop some things about how ministry is done. We're going through culturally... What's happened is the Industrial Revolution is over. The information age is here. And you're, 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 you're having a convergence of several things. One is the 500-year cycle of things. Uh, you, you remember the Mayan calendar a couple of years ago, and everybody said the world's going to come to an end. The Mayan calendar had nothing to do with the, with the, with the planet of the universe coming to an end. It had cycles that, that, that would come to an end. And, you know, they, they, they put everything on, on, a, on a circle, and when they got down to the end of the circle, they had to get another circle, another stone to put it on. And that's what that was about. But there is truth in, in the idea of, of, of the cyclical nature of history. We studied, when we were studying that some years ago, and I called it dots, lines, and circles. You look at time in three ways. One, it's a dot. It's a point in time right now that you have to deal with. It's a line because it's going somewhere. That's a series of dots. But it's also a circle because... He says there's nothing new under the sun. Things kind of go this way. That's part of the nature of the way things go. And you think, you think in that punctilier, you think linear, or you think cyclical, you should think in all of them. The problem is the three, uh, the three cult, different cultures think just one way. Someone, was it here last night, yesterday, someone was mentioning about, uh, about time. And uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't here. Uh, they... they, they I'm, I'm trying to remember. I was trying to use a more more personal illustration, but you go in some cultures, and you know they say, "Well, well what are we work? Well, we're working on. We were in the Philippines, so we're working on Filipino time. Going to have a meeting at seven o'clock, and about seven twenty, we decide to go to the meeting. <laughs> Everybody gets there about nine o'clock. You say, "What's that? What's well, Filipino time? You know, just, and and there's some cultural reasons for that. Okay, 
Well, that's, there's a, way, a certain way to look at time that causes you to do that. Europeans look at time far more. Western world looks at more linear. That means you've got a goal that you're headed for. You're going somewhere. The cyclical time, mostly the, the, the Oriental thought, is wherever we're going, we've been there before. That's the cyclical. And your Bible teaches all three of those to understand things. Well, when you understand that with that one of those cycles is part of what we're going on, you're not just seeing the Industrial Revolution go away and, and the Information Age start, but you're seeing a real watershed. One of the things the Industrial Revolution did was it said, instead of you making a widget and you making your widget and you making your widget and you making your widget and everybody making widgets, We'll make them all for you. We'll set up a factory. We'll make, all, we'll make widgets for everybody. And we can make it and give it to you, and it'll be cheaper than, and a lot less work than you making it. All you got to do is just come and get it. We'll make it. And, but when we make it, we'll make them all exactly alike. Cookie cutter. That's where you get universities, colleges, seminaries, Bible college, that's where that all, that all, that's the culture of the Industrial Revolution. If you went before the Industrial Revolution, they didn't have those kind of institution training things. People were trained for the ministry differently, called Mance training. They were trained in, 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 in basically in local churches and local ministries. And all that changed with the Industrial Revolution where you, you send someone off. You know, Henry Ford said you can have any, you, everybody can have their own, own car, any color you want, long as it's black, <laughs> when he made the Model T. Because they had the factory, and it then and for seven fifty everybody could have a car. Well, that was a wonderful thing. And it did, but what it did is it changed the way things were done. And now you have a so now you send everybody to this school to be taught. Everybody's taught the same, and then they're they're sent out. That's exactly the opposite of the way Paul said to do it. But the culture drove that. What's happening now is those institutions have awakened to the fact that they're going to die. And so they've all established distant learning. We have people right here in our assembly who've gotten their bachelor's degrees without going to a college campus almost at all. Do it all on the Internet. You say, well, how can you do that? When we started Grace School of the Bible, everybody's laughing. I don't extension school. Nobody do that kind of stuff. Now everybody has distance learning. They, they don't call it extension school. They call it distant learning. Same thing. But because you're worth $50 billion, you call it something better. And, you know, when, you, when you're in debt, 10000 you have to call it whatever you can call it. So you, you have to understand where, where things are going, which means that you're going to go through some things that I really don't know how to tell you specifically how to work through. That's okay. The way we do ministry in Chicago is different than we did it in Alabama. When I first moved to Chicago in 79, Started preaching down at the old North Shore Church building, which was way down in the, on the North Shore of Chicago, Wilson Avenue and Sheridan Road. I, uh, big old building. I mean, at one time they had 1,200 people in the assembly there. Uh, there were about a, maybe 80 people left. And, well, you know, we're ministering there, and I'm, I'm used to going out preaching on the street and doing that kind of stuff. So I go down there and start preaching on the street. Cop comes up to me and says, What are you doing? And I said, I'm letting people have these. I'll let you have one. Tell, tell you how to go to heaven. He said, son, maybe you should come sit in the car here. I said, oh, this is America. Didn't you understand? I, I land of the free, home of the brave. I can do this. He said, no, that's not what I mean. I just need to talk to you. So I sit down there with, with him in the car. And he says, you see that lady on the corner over there? I said, yeah. He said, what do you think she's doing? I said, waiting on a bus? Yeah. <laughs> Turned out she wasn't waiting on a bus. <laughs> and uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't know what was going on. Montrose and Wilson Avenue is one of the... One of the one, <laughs> one of the worst neighborhoods in Chicago at the time. And he says, does anybody come up and talk to you? I said, well, yeah, that young boy over there. He, says, What's he said, he said uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, what do you say? I give one of these. He comes back about every 15 minutes. He says, do you know what he is? I, said, I guess he just doesn't have anything to do. He said, no, no, he's a runner. And he began to explain to me how the street worked. I didn't know anything about that. I went home and I said, boy, I don't know anything about ministering in Chicago. All these Catholics. All these nitwits on the street. Moody Bible Institute, they all know. 
I went up to Moody, took a class on urban evangelism, went three weeks and riding home with Chuck Milkovich, he and I went down there and, and we were our third week we came home. I said, Chuck, that guy didn't know more about what he's talking about than we do. <laughs> he got no more clue than I do. And I mean, I finished the class, but he didn't. I went up to Trinity. I said, you guys have got to have figured out how to reach Catholics, as many of them are in this area. They didn't. Have, oh, well, you know, I said, biggest evangelical seminary in the world. We didn't get any help. Met a lot of nice people. We used to have a conference up there for a number of years. And uh, one of the professors there listened to the radio program. And I, I used to go up every couple of years, about twice a year, and have lunch with him and talk to him about right division, <laughs> about grace. He, he never got it, but it was interesting that he was open. One day I'm thinking about this thing, and it dawned on me. Ricky, the ministry in Chicago is the same it was in Alabama. It's just a different setting. What's the work of the ministry? What's the will of God? All men be and. So what's the work of the ministry? Get people saved, get the, get the saints know the truth. I said, oh. I know how to do that. You understand what I'm saying? I, I, I was thinking that I had to adjust the work of the ministry because of my surroundings. And what I realized was the work of the ministry is still the work of the ministry like it always was because it's what 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says it is. I just need to figure out how to do that in this different situation. Now, if I went to Bulgaria, I needed to do it. I need to learn Bulgarian. Or have a translator that could speak Bulgarian. Done that. That's all, that's all you're going to have to do. As the culture changes, you're going to have to learn how to translate the truth into that. You don't change the message. You don't change the truth. You don't adopt their method, their de description of success, because it's ruined them. So you're going to have to, you're going to see that. You're going to need to be alert to where you are. You're not in the 50s. You're not in the 70s. You're not in the 80s. And all the things that people did back then that worked aren't going to work in the future. When we were in Chicago on Neva, a place where we were before this location, I went and got maps of the area. We knocked on every door Within that, we had a zip code, 60634, 28,000 mail drops, and we visited every one of them. <laughs> Businesses, homes. Anybody there? In Chicago, people don't come to the door very often. A guy says to me, he said, I, I, you know what? I've been reading about these guys they're called telemarketers. They've figured out how instead of selling door to door, they call. I said, well, how do you do that? We started doing, you know what we found out? If I spent a Saturday knocking on doors, I could hit maybe 25, 30, talk to five people. I could sit in that same time and, and call 200 homes and talk to 50 people. Now, I don't know about you, but I like efficiency. And you know what? When you knock on the door, people look to see who's there. When the phone rings, five people run to answer it. Are you listening to me? What's the issue? Knocking on doors. No, the issue isn't knocking on doors. The issue is sharing the gospel with people and figuring out how to get them to come to the door to talk to you. Or maybe you get beyond the door through the electronics. See, that's, that's, that's in an old school way of talking about what I'm talking about. You're going to, you're going to see involved in that an opportunity to stand on the shoulders of people who've gone before you. Some of you, you guys are going to be able to stand on the shoulders. I've stood on the shoulders of men like Cornelius Stam. Charles Baker, J.C. O'Hare, they stood on the shoulders of men before them. You think of Mr. Stam. 
He spent a whole lifetime. Things that differ, Paul's apostleship and message, our great commission, the first volume of the book of Acts, those books are classics, irreplaceable. Everybody needs to read them, study them, understand what they teach. It took him a lifetime to get that information. You can assimilate it all in six months. I did. I got saved December 31st, 1962, and by August of that year, I'd read Paul's epistles through three dozen times, and I had read everything Stam and Baker and a dozen other guys had written. And I could teach you God's Word, not out of their books. I've never used one of their books to teach. I don't understand people that do that. But I could teach you God's Word in light of what I understood from those books. In less than a year, I assimilated the whole lifetime of that man's ministry. Pastor Stam, I worked with him for eight years. I knew him personally. His great contribution was that distinctive ministry of Paul. And about everything else, he's pretty much normal to less than good, quite frankly. His commentaries on Romans, if it came between William Newell and Mr. Stam's commentary on Romans, I'd say get William Newell's. I helped him. I, I, I worked with him when he wrote it. It's his first volume of the book of Acts, there isn't anything like it in print and never will be anything better. Okay? Why? His ministry, his contribution was that issue of that dispensational clarity. Now, if I could assimilate that in six months, I should be able to stand on that and take that where it would, and, and, and go where that would lead me. You follow that? We've done that here. In our ministry, four things. Number one was the Bible issue. Number two was how to rightly divide it. We asked Paul how to do it. That's where the time passed, but now ages to come came from. Then we said, perfected saints are to do the work of the ministry, then how do you perfect a saint? Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, there is a Paul's design for how God would perfect a saint. I'll just tell you straight out, you know, I, I, I hear people telling people what I believe, what I don't believe. You go back before 1980 and find anybody that you can find that would use Romans 16, verse 25 and 26 as a Pauline design for edification. <laughs> Show them to me. You'll only find one person. I, listen, I know the landscape of the grace movement. I know other places. I know the only place you'll find that is a young preacher down in Alabama studying it. Okay? I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling you. I, but I know where that came from. Where that came from was having that understanding about the distinctiveness of Paul's ministry, knowing that's where you had to get your edification and looking there for it. You follow that? I read Jesse little Baxter's book, studied through the Bible the first time with it explore the book. And he's got a very clear layout of Paul's epistles. It's according to that design. He didn't see that, but that's what it is. I didn't know it. But then later on, I learned that Baxter had learned that from Bullinger, because in Bullinger's Bible, he's got that kind of thing. Not as clear as Baxter, but back, he stood on Bullinger's shoulder. Then Bullinger stood on some guy before him. I stood on his shoulder. And I care, you, you follow, it, nobody, it's, it's developing the truth. Okay? Then we said, how about the ministry model of Paul? Perfected saints, but how do you do, what is the work of the ministry? And we discovered that local church pattern. And we said, that's, the, so let's do it that way. Now, that's the foundation, that's an elevated, listen, when Mr. Stam preached the distinctive ministry of Paul and O'Hare and those brothers, O'Hare was the leader. O'Hare was the sort of, they used to call him the titular head. I never figured out what that meant. But they, Mr. O'Hare represented hundreds of other men just like him. But O'Hare had the, 
He had that ability to just draw. He had what Woody, Oscar Woodall used to call inviting power. When they were going to start a, a Bible institute, Pastor Stam told me that O'Hare wanted to start a Bible institute in Chicago, and he said he wanted to start it there at Wilson and Sheridan. And he said his idea was to tear the church building down and build a nine-story building in which that would house the church, the church and the Bible Institute. And he said, we'd have 600 students the first year. And O'Hare and Baker said, whoa, wait a minute, we can't do that. And they wound up, they've never had more than 150 students in the whole ministry of, that, of their school. And he said, well, why? Well, O'Hare had a vision. And you know what? They knew, Stan told me, he said, we knew he'd have done it. <laughs> he'd have had them. But then that had to teach them. Now, I don't know about you, but my attitude is how much more difficult is it to develop a curriculum for 600 than for 20? The answer is none. <laughs> and can I tell you, it's more fun to do it for 600 than 20? <laughs> but there's a different mindset, see? But O'Hare was just, he, he had this ability to just gather people. Mr. Baker was the educator, Mr. Stan, he's the academic. Did you notice last night Brian is an academic? You notice that? That's what he is. He's a historian. He's trained that way. He's got, got a master's degree in that. And uh, he, he teaches it. That's what he does. But you can see in his demeanor. So Mr. Baker was the academic. Mr. Stam was the writer. O'Hare was the preacher. Maybe I should put it that way. And O'Hare pastored a large church, and it was the the ministry of his local church, it was Bultum up in Michigan and his local church. It was Gruby down in Alabama in his local church. It was Peterson out in Washington in the local church that carried the ministry with these men. The preaching ministry did. And the writing ministry and the educators came along. I, I, I hope you're listening. So you, you see that pattern in all that. That's where you come from. We've stood on that, and it's never been just me. The ground we have covered in the last 30 years with Grace School of the Bible, I mean, I taught some of the things. I, I understand I taught these things, but we together have grown as a group and pressed on with understandings, things we call the grace alternatives, the application of grace to the life, We've got the dispensation. By the way, one of the big mistakes that O'Hare, Baker, and Stam made dispensationally was putting the 12 in the body of Christ. Because when you put the 12 in the body of Christ, you marry yourself to the Hebrew epistles. Well, we've, we've, we understand that. Mr. Stam used to tell me, we'd, we'd talk about it. He said, well, we settled out in the 50s. I said, well, brother, it didn't settle now. And everybody now knows different. Now, you don't blame him for that. They figured out so much that if they didn't get to that yet, don't worry about it. It didn't take me long to, to learn what they taught me, and then I could go work on some of the other stuff. So some of you young, you're going to learn what's there. Don't dismiss it. Learn it. And as you do, there'll be some more ground to... to you follow that? The way that works, the way wisdom is developed is very important to understand. In Colossians chapter 1, verse number, number 9, Paul says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, being filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in your Bible are inseparably united. Amen. They are intertwined in the way life in creation is designed to work. Come back with me to Proverbs chapter 3. When this stuff, by the way, about uh, 
the two inheritances came up. And I, I was talking to one of the brothers about it. And I said to him, you know, one of the things that we need to do is, I think, is to re-examine or further examine, not so much re-examine, the issue of what does it mean to reign with Christ? Because most of the time you think of reigning as telling that person what to do, this person what to do, bossing people around, right? Well, in Mark 10, Jesus told his disciples when they wanted to do that, he said specifically, that's not the way it works in my kingdom. That's the way the Gentiles do it. They're on a power, they're on a power position, power. Me be boss, you, you be servant. He said, in my kingdom, the way you reign is you become a servant. The Son of Man came to give His life. You remember that passage, Mark 10? And He specifically said there's two ways to reign. One like the Gentiles, power of mad, power structure, power position, telling people what to do. And the other one is His way. And most of the time, and I have to confess, in my thinking about it, most of the time I've thought about doing it like the Gentiles do it. <laughs> We're going to judge angels. We're going to tell them dudes what to do. We're not going to do what we tell them to do because we know what to do. And we're boss. And then you say, but wait a minute. Jesus said that's not the way it's going to be in his kingdom. And we're going to be in his heavenly kingdom. So there needs to be a little bit of reevaluation. I think there's a real whole area of thinking to do in that, and not get caught up about trying to be sure. Be, tell that guy over there is not going to get to rain because he don't think like I think about something. And most of that stuff came out of trying to figure out if an Acts 2 guy can reign with an Acts 9 guy and have as much power. And... Anyway, and the guys, it's, it's, it's not bad guys that have got into that stuff. It's just bad stuff that they've, they've gotten carried away into. And by the way, it's not anything new. They, they're, they're, they're saying to you that it's new, developed, further advancement of truth. I could go to my office and bring out here and read to you a commentary written by a popular Baptist preacher and he, in Acts, uh, Romans 8, 17, and he says that there are two inheritances. One is a gift of God, one's an earned reward. That's exactly what they say. Ain't nothing new. So it's, it's old Baptist doctrine. You know what it is? The reason it becomes a legalism? What do you do when you depart from Paul? There's no place to go but back to the law if you're going to stay in the Bible. And over there in, in, in 2 Corinthians, 2, 1 Timothy chapter 1, we talks about those people, they, they leave Paul and they go back and teach the law. They're adding the law with it. He said they don't understand what they say or where they're from. They don't realize they're doing it. And as soon, see, the law is a performance based. So the law isn't just that you're going to have to tithe, that you're going to have to use 2 Chronicles 7 14, or you're going to. The law is you make a performance based system out of something. If I were them, what I would be worried, working on is how do you get a reward without it being a performance-based thing? Now, I think I know how. I know they don't know how. But I think it would be a place that we could study. Instead of doing all this yak-yak, which is what comes when you depart. What do you say? Proud, all that stuff. So that's, that's, that's not, the denom not just the denominational God. It. it can be you and me. I anyway, Proverbs 3.19. This is a long dis discourse that's been going on through here in chapter 3 about wisdom. You know, it's verse 13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom 
and the man that getteth understanding. Verse 19, here's what he's talking about. The Lord, hath, the Lord by wisdom hath what? By understanding he hath established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop the dew. When God, when Jesus Christ stepped out of nothing and said, created the heaven and the earth, he did it by wisdom, by understanding, and by knowledge that he already had. He placed his wisdom, his understanding, and his knowledge, this plan that he had, into creation. So when you look at creation, what should you be able to discover? That he put there. Because he put it there. So I look at that and I say, wow. He put man on the earth. And he said, go out and replenish. He said, go out and multiply. Be, be fruitful, start. They're married. You've got to be married before you can be fruitful. Be fruitful. Have a family. Multiply. Let your families have families and build a culture. Replenish the earth. Go out here and Fill up the earth with a, a culture. What kind of culture? One that has wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that God has put in the creation. And subdue it. And if you go to Genesis 1 and look at that, after the word subdue is a colon. Multiply, replenish, subdue, colon. And have dominion. You know what having dominion in the earth is? Multiplying, replenishing, subduing. To subdue the earth means to harness it. What were you going to harness in the earth? What did God put in the earth? We say put trees. But, but what did he really put in the earth? Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Am I getting to you with that? I don't know if I am or not, but... You go all through. You go through Israel's program. And what are they doing? They're finding the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding God put in the earth for them. You know what we do? We, in the heavenly program, we find the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that God put in Christ for us. And then when we're in the ages to come, what are we doing? We are demonstrating the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that God put in Christ, they have, that he put in the earth to exalt his Son. You work on that for 10 years, come teach it to me. <laughs> and you talk about it wanting to, wanting to advance something. There's an idea. Somebody asked me, said, what do you think the next advancement's going to be? I have no idea, but that'd be one I'd work on. Anyway, look over at Proverbs 24, <clears throat> verse 3. Through wisdom is a house builded... By understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. It's going to take wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to get something established. They work together. They take counsel together. If you're going to develop new ideas, advanced ideas, you're going to press understanding forward in the new territory, you're not going to do it by yourself Wisdom doesn't do it by itself. It works with understanding. It works with knowledge. You're not going to do it sitting off somewhere in a, in a room looking at a wall by yourself, talking to people on a computer or on a telephone. You're going to have to do it with, with what we in the world I call peer review. You're going to have to do it with communicating with other people that, that, can, that can do That's what wisdom, knowledge, and understanding does. They work together. They counsel t together. You follow that? That's important to get. Come with me over to chapter, uh, I'll go back to chapter 4. Proverbs 4, verse 7. Fifty-four times in the book of Proverbs, wisdom and understanding are, are coupled together. Proverbs 4, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Understanding is the principal facilitator of wisdom. That's why they're inseparable. 
If you look over at chapter 8, it's one of, one of, my, one of the most outstanding passages. Chapter 8, verse, one, verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. So wisdom is talking. Verse 14, counsel is mine sound, and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Wisdom says I'm understanding. Wisdom identifies itself inseparably with understanding. So if you're going to develop one, how do you, what do you do? You've got to have the other. They work together. And they're... Come over to chapter 10. Verse 23. It is the sport... It is, it is as sport foolishness, fun, that kind of stuff, to a fool to do mischief. But a man of understanding hath wisdom. Look at chapter 14, verse 33. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding. See that? Look over at chapter 17, verse 24. Wisdom is before him that hath understanding. Understanding is the spiritual prerequisite to wisdom. They work together. That's how truth is developed. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel together, work together to establish the thing. That's important to see that. Come with me to Job chapter 32. Where does, where does understanding come from? If it's the starting point, Job 32, here's one of the overlooked verses in the Bible issue. Job 32 verse 8. Elihu is going to answer Job and his friends, and he says in verse, one, verse 7, I said, days shall speak and multitude of years shall teach wisdom, but there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth understanding. Where will you find the inspiration of the Almighty? You got it in your lap. And the inspiration of the Almighty does what? It gives understanding. And understanding is a prerequisite for wisdom. You remember, I, I'm not going to read the verses because of time, but you remember in Acts chapter 8, the eunuch is riding along, Philip comes to him, and Philip says, Understandest what thou readest? And what does he say? How can I? I have no man to guide me. Needed a teacher. Acts 18, Apollos comes into Ephesus, a man eloquent in Scripture, mighty in the Scripture, an eloquent man. He only knows the gospel, the message of John. Imagine in Acts 18, you don't know anything with John the Baptist's message, but you're out preaching it. <laughs> I don't know where you've been. Back in the backside of the desert somewhere. And Priscilla and Aquila take him, and they teach him the way of God more perfectly. They de they're developing. The eunuch had wisdom, some understanding, but he needed to have it carried forward. Light he didn't have. Apollos had some understanding. He, that's, how that's, that, that's how that works. The process of the Word working through the interchange with the saints. That's why that local assembly is so critically important. That's why that anonymity is so dangerous. And that's why the isolation is such a problem. We didn't develop where we are today in a vacuum. 
We got thrown out of every group there is to get thrown out of. <laughs> About two dozen men sat in my living room back in those days. A man from Ted's church was there, Harold, visiting us that weekend. We sat there talking about what do we do now? One of them said, what are we going to call the new organization? Nobody said anything. They all looked at me. And I said, who in this room would like to nominate me for the board of an organization? We weren't going to have any organization. That was the problem. We just got kicked out of an organization. <laughs> Why would we want to go start another organization to get somebody kicked out of? <laughs> Let's go home and start some churches and quit trying to be kingdom builders. Big fishes in little ponds. Supposing gain is godliness. But we kept an association, fellow soldiers, and a fellowship. And that fellowship is what developed and helped us push forward to where we are now. What we've done is what you're going to have to do in the future. Now, you don't forget us old guys. You build on, okay? One of the things I've always been sensitive about is the older I get is to be careful to listen to newer guys and ideas. When the thing about the pre-trib rapture not being true came up, came up back in, you know, a decade and a half ago, we spent six years talking about that among our the, all the preachers. We got, I, I invited come to Chicago, we had 20 guys or so come here, and we sat down and we talked about it. it. Wasn't just one guy off over yonder with the idea, and he had sense enough to come and sit with us and talk about it. And it was six years before anybody in the public heard about it. Because we said, look, here's a brother we trust and a brother we love, and maybe he's learned something we need to hear. And though I hold this truth and believe it, I'm willing to listen. And we did. And we gave it a complete review and decided, no, we were right to start. <laughs> no, you know what? We learned a bunch of stuff about what we, what we thought about it. We sharpened our understanding about it. We clarified some things. We still believed it. But we, we understand it better now, at least I do. But we spent years doing that together. And when the time came to say, we're not going that route, and somebody else says, well, we are, we shook hands and we said, God bless you, we love you, you're going that way, I'm going this way, we're not going to throw Molotov cocktails at each other. Had a guy do that one time at one of our conferences. <laughs> we're not going to hate each other, we just decided we're going to believe something, we, we see something different. But that's how you maintain truth, and that's important. And I, I, I'm, 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 I, it, it's a thrill to me to be able to tell you I've worked with guys that can sh set an example in that area for you. Now, there, i got three things to tell you that you've got to do. Number one, you've got to have four things. You've got to have a final authority. Amen. Look with me at Jeremiah 23. There's got to be something that you decide is going to be the bottom line. I sat with Mr. Stam one time, and he was, we were talking about the Bible issue, and he was very provoked at me. for. He said, you just don't believe that you can possibly, he was trying to show me mistakes in the King James Bible. And he says, well, you just don't believe there is any. I said, well, that's right. I don't go around looking for mistakes in my Bible. You're, you're right, I, you know. And I, I give it the benefit of the doubt, and if you show me, the, you show me one, and I go find, I'll go check it and see. I don't just accept that it is. He finally got down to 
mistakes like typographical errors. That thing Brian did last night about that colon and semicolon, he'd say, see, that's an error. <laughs> and I'd say, well, if that's what you're talking about, okay, that's a difference. I got eyes, I can see it's different. But God never, when God talks about preserving his word, he's not talking about punctuations <laughs> kind of stuff. Those kind of, the, yeah. I look at that and say, you know. The guys that believe something, he, he, if you believe that the translators were inspired, then you've got a problem with that. If you believe the Bible's been preserved, then you don't have a problem with that. But he was telling, we, we were talking about one time, and I, and I asked him, I said, well, just tell me something. Is there a place, a book, anywhere, any book, any, any place, anywhere, that you'd sit on that table and say, every time it speaks, it's right. Every time you disagree with it, you're wrong. He took his fist and found it down on my Bible and said, absolutely not. You are so stupid, you make me so mad. <laughs> well, he was six foot three. You didn't want to make him mad. <laughs> and it, it irritated him. Okay. Well, okay. It's no, no sense to be irritated when you believe something. But no, there's no book anywhere. You know what? If I believe that, I believe anything I want to believe because I can go find a book that teaches anything I want to teach. You can prove anything in a library. You need a final authority. Jeremiah 23, verse, verse 28. You know, Paul says, preach the word. You ought to write this verse down beside that verse. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Before you can speak his word faithfully, what's it say? He that hath my word. If you don't have the word, you can't speak it faithfully. You need to know how to write to divide it. Look with me at 1 Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Timothy 4.15 Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. So here's something you need to spend some time with, right? What is he talking about? Verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Notice, you're not to just give attention to preaching and to the doctrine, you're to give attention to reading. The Bible is the only book you'll ever find that people study by reading books about it and not reading it. Now, let me deal with you a minute. How much time do you spend every week reading your Bible? You're right. I mean, think about it. How much time in the last seven days have you just spent reading God's Word? Do you read it through every year? If you don't, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be reading it through about four times a year. You say, boy, it take a lot of time. Yeah, uh-huh. You're going to get out from in front of the television. You're going to get off the golf course. You're going to get off the... All right? But what are you going to be doing? You're going to be doing something of eternal value. But what does he say? Give attendance. Show up. You know what attendance is. You're here. You're attending. Show up. To what? Reading. He hadn't said study it yet. He just said read it. If you don't get it into your mind, and what happens with preachers is you think you know it so you don't have to read it. When I teach a book, I'm teaching Hosea on Wednesday night. I read Hosea once a week. I'm teaching Ephesians on Sunday morning. I read Ephesians once a week. I'm teaching 1 Timothy on Sunday night. I read it once a week. I take a plane trip. Just the last plane trip I took, I read Hosea to Malachi. Three times on the trip there and back. Why? Because he says, give attendance to reading. People ask me, say, Brother Rick, how do you know so much about the Bible? I'm as dumb a thump as you are, if not worse. You know how you do it? You spend 50 years reading it. That's how you do it. It's no secret. And if you can't do it, I can tell you the first reason you can't do it is you haven't spent 50 years reading it. And before you think you're going to learn to rightly divide it, 
you need to read it so you know what you're rightly dividing. And if you don't spend the time reading your Bible, I don't know what you're reading, what you're doing. You're watching Fox News and you're, you're watching the Internet and watching YouTube and watching MSNBC or you're watching all that stupid garbage. Blip, 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 blip. <laughs> with nothing but lies and prevarications and trying to hype you up. All they're doing is trying to keep you watching so they can get your credits and run to the bank and sell advertising. Oh, yeah. That's all that is. And you think that you're going to save America by listening to that. Get fired up about it. Well, now you're back in Israel's program trying to build a kingdom. That's what the church has done. We're going to take our values and inculcate it into the culture, and we're going to save America. Well, how's that working out for you? Now they're frustrated because it didn't work in. Why? It wasn't working to start with. Somebody says, I'm going to pray and ask God to heal my daughter. I'm going to pray and ask God to heal my aunt. I'm going to pray and ask God to heal my husband. How's that working out for you? You say, well, they got better. That's, I don't see anybody in the Bible getting healed, got better. They got healed. And you say, well, God just didn't have it in his plan. Well, now, wait a minute. Is he healing people because it's his plan or because you ask him? If it's his plan, what are you asking him for? He's going to do what he's going to do. If it's his will, he'll do it. Then you need to just shut up and let his will work out. It didn't, you think you're going to change his will? I mean, come on. And so you get all confused about that. You know why you get confused? Because you're back over in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John trying to claim verses. It ain't got anything to do with God's doing, what God's doing today. Then some yo-yo comes along and he says, well, don't you know that Epaphroditus got healed in Philippians 2? And I say, have you ever read Philippians 2? I don't mean you read what the preacher said about it. Did you ever read it? Did you ever read over there in Philippians 2 about anybody getting healed? I got a book in my office. I got two of them in there about all the miracles in the Bible. You know Philippians 2 not in either one of them. He says, God had mercy on Epaphroditus and on me. Did he heal Paul too? I mean, if, if your excuse for getting healed is Epaphroditus in, in Philippians chapter 2, man, you are at the bottom of the rung. And somebody needs to pull the plug so you don't drown. And you know what happens? People get all discouraged, frustrated, mad, angry. People watching you from the outside look at you and think you're nuts. You know, why, you know why the church doesn't have any credibility in the world today? They're over here trying to do something God isn't doing. You can't make God do something he isn't doing. Chicken's coming home to roost. And the poor believer doesn't know why. You need a final authority that you read. And when you read it, then you can rightly divide it. And you won't be rightly dividing it because some preacher showed you a bunch of outlines about prophecy and mystery and Israel and the body. But because when, when you see that, you know in the Scripture, your mind can go to those Scriptures and see it. And you, you look at a path. You know, one of the dangers of using these things is you put verses up there and people quit looking at the Bible to look at this. And when you look at your Bible, you look at the whole page. You look at the context. On that, you just keep blipping verses, and I can teach you anything doing that. I'm not opposed to those. I'm just telling you there's something you need to think about when you use them. Maybe you should just put the reference up there and let people look at the verse in their Bible. My son, he's sitting back there one Sunday and somebody told him, said, it isn't polite to text while your daddy's preaching. He said, I'm not texting. I got my phone, my Bible on my phone. <laughs> you know, old, old dudes don't know you have Bibles on your phones, you know. <laughs> But it's good to look at your Bible. Read it. Then rightly divide it. Chapter 2, 2 Timothy, verse 8. You know these verses. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. 
Verse 7, it says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. You want to have understanding in things? You get it from Paul. So one, you need to have a Bible. You need to rightly divide the Bible. You spend time reading your Bible, you won't have as much time meddling in all this other stuff. You spend, I, I was in, talked to a kid recently. He's in a bad trouble. I said, you know what you need to do? You need to take the first eight chapters of Romans and read them about 40 times. You've got plenty of time. He's in jail. You know what would help you? Do the same thing. Just let it get in your mind. Instead of trying to guess what it said. You need to maintain the simplicity that's in Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Second Corinthians 11, 3, For I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. You know the simplicity that's in Christ is? That's why we have that written on that board right there. That's the, it can't get any simpler than that. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God's as rich to you as he is to me in Jesus Christ. It's being in Christ that's the issue. I love that verse in 1 John. He says, He that hath the Son hath life. You receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And here's the witness of God. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Could have been as simpler than that. You either got him or you don't. If you got him, you got life. If you don't, Any questions? That's pretty simple. It's sin that complicates life. And what's the strength of sin? The law. So what's the law do? It complicates life. Who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption? Now, if you need some more things beside, beside wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, get those down, and then the rest will be in them too. But you know what you'll find? You'll spend most of your life just getting through enjoying those things. Wisdom is in Him. In Him, in whom hit all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Righteousness. You have the righteousness of God in Him. Sanctification. You know where you get sanctified? The word sanctify means to be set apart for the purpose for which you were created. You get that in Christ. Redemption, freedom, liberty. I'm free. Not to live the way I used to live, the way I wanted to live, but to live as a servant of righteousness. Where you get that? In Christ. He that spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all. How should not with him also freely give us all things? <laughs> if you let that be the value standard of all that you do, let the sufficiency of God's grace, you know, that'll get rid of all the religion. I think the greatest argument against the practice of water baptism and the dispensation of grace is it because God has made me complete in Christ? What do you have with your water baptism that I didn't have without it? Amen. Amen to that. I know people that got rid of water baptism on that. Had nothing to do with them, dispensational understanding. I know some preachers that got rid of water baptism on the basis that didn't know anything about right division. You know what? I like their way of getting rid of it better than any of them. Because that's really the reason Paul got rid of it. You need to maintain Paul's example. So if you've got the Word, you've got a final authority. You know, you read it, you take it in, 
You rightly divide it. You let it be life. And you let it sustain the grace of God in your life. Then you're ready to get out and do the work of the ministry. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to stop and we're going to take a break. And Philippians 3 verse 17. Brethren, I be, be followers together of me. How many times do you say that? Be followers of me even as I am of Christ. You became followers of me and the Lord. <laughs> Why? The Lord Jesus Christ made Paul your pattern. Be followers together of me. You guys together as a church. Follow me and mark them which walk, watch, so as ye have us for an example. Everybody likes the verse over there in Romans where it says, Mark them and avoid them which walk contrary to the doctrine. I got you on that. Here's one that says, Mark the guy that walks in the doctrine, and that's the guy to walk with. Go take a magic marker and put a big old X on the guy to avoid and put a big old zero around the head of the guy to, to hang with and hang with the zeros. <laughs> now, you don't understand that. When I read a book, in the margin, if I disagree with something, I put an X. If I agree with it, I put a zero. If I want to go back and check it, I put a check mark. After I've checked it, I do that. That's the guy you want to hang with. <laughs> but mark them out. Find them. Here you are, guys. Find them, mark them, and walk with them. How do you know them? Verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. You're going to know them by their conversation. You're going, to have, you're going to have a book that's your authority. You're going to read it. You're going to store it up in your inner man. You're going to understand the grace of God that it teaches you to, it leads you to your sufficiency in Christ. And then you're listening for people that know that and that, that preach that, that teach that. You can identify the ones that don't and say, well, that's, but here's the guys that do, and I want to hang with the ones that do because that's how you develop. Come with me to one. I got three minutes. I'm going to do one one verse. I just come with me to Matthew chapter eleven and First Corinthians chapter eight. So first thing I, I tried to say, you, you have to have some things. You have to have a final authority. You have to have the word rightly divided. You have to have the grace of God as your sufficiency. You have to have Paul's model. First Corinthians 8. Here's something you need to avoid. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, you know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Notice knowledge isn't enough. And if any man think that he know anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought to know. Nothing yet, as he ought to know. Knowledge, the way you need to know it, doesn't come from just knowing it. Charity is the labor of love. Charity is liberality. It's, it's, it's not just liberality to the poor and needy like the Ely Mossonary institutions of the world. Charity is love, the ability to value and esteem a thing the way God does, think about it the way God does, put into action. 
So you don't want to just have a bunch of knowledge. You want the knowledge to produce the results in your life, in your thinking, in your relationships, in this case here is with the weaker brother, that it's designed to produce. You want to know the word rightly divided. You want to understand the sufficiency of Christ. You want to follow Paul's model. And you want to do it in such a way that it lives in you. Okay? Now I want to give you an example of the knowledge puffing up but not doing you any good. There's a, there's a thing in Matthew 11. I'm just going to use this as an illustration, not the doctrine of the, of the text because we don't have enough time to go over all that. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein, he, uh, wherein most of his mighty works had been done, because they repented not. And he said, unto, uh, uh, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Zidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, hast brought down, uh, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in thee should have been done in Sodom, it would have repented, I'm sorry, it would have remained until this day. Those three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Capernaum was the headquarters of the, Lord, of the Lord's ministry during that period of time. The other two cities were like suburbs. They were the places where Jesus did most of his mighty works. All three of those cities knew who Jesus was. They were familiar with him. They had seen him. It says, if the mighty works which have been done in thee, this is the cities where, verse 20, where he did most of his mighty works were done. These people were familiar with his ministry. They'd, they'd seen it. They, they, they knew him. He spent a lot of time there. They'd seen his miracles. They had all that evidence, but they didn't believe it. They had all that knowledge, but they didn't believe any of it. He said, Tyre and Zidon. Two wicked places. He only visited Zidon one time. After this, he hadn't him done it up to here. It's in Matthew 15. Sodom. Could you think of a more wicked place than Sodom? He said, it's be better in the judgment for them. If they had seen all you saw, they would have repented. <laughs> You guys got all this knowledge. They were centers of Baal worshiping version of Judaism in the northern kingdom. They were centers of apostate Israel. In the midst, Jesus did all these miracles to show the truth. Sometime you can know way too much and believe way too little. That's the point. That's what they did. Religion is a hindrance to knowing God. It can keep you from trusting Him. The gain is godliness definition of ministry is the essence of religion. Flee that. Follow the example of Paul. Mark those that walk as Paul walked. And be ready for the fight that'll come. You do that, and you'll be able to take the future where it needs to go. Now, we're going to take another 10-minute break. Don't go get something to eat because we're, after this next session, we're going to eat lunch. Okay? We'll be back in here in 10. I'll give you a chance to go to the restroom or something. We'll be back in here in 10 minutes.